Greetings, Church, a gracious and warm welcome to you on this ninth Sunday after Pentecost. We want to give a, wel a welcome to all of those who are joining us online and also invite you to come to any of our services that we have either in our parking lot over at Faith or here in the sanctuary at Bethany. A big thank you to Phyllis Nelson for playing today and Jonathan Larson for keeping every, all the audio visual stuff going. And then also, uh, VBS Online has started here at Bethany. If you just go to the Bethany website, there's a whole bunch of videos that have been put together by all our ministers in that arena to help the kids have some sort of VBS this summer. And it looks awesome. So take the time to check that out and take part in that. Well, with that being said, let us calm our hearts and our minds before we begin in worship. Well, let us begin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. 
The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Let us pray. Glorious God, your generosity waters the world with goodness, and you cover creation with abundance. Awaken in us a hunger for the food that satisfies both body and spirit, and with this food fill all the starving world through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Genesis, the 32nd chapter. At night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and set them across the stream, and likewise, everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus heard about the beheading of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great, a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowd away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, If they need not go away, you give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowd to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowd. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full, and those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. If you're a person that struggles with your faith, 
If you feel you have more doubt than belief, more resistance than trust, and are more apt to being cautious than to take that leap of faith, then today's Old Testament story is for you. Today's Genesis narrative brings us back again to Jacob, the patriarch that we talked about for the last three weeks, who we understand is an important cog in faith development. In fact, we've mentioned numerous times that it was from Jacob we get the word Israel. And it's from Jacob's son that the nation of Israel was formed. But it was Jacob's character, his tenacity and struggle, his wrestling with God and with others that helped to identify how God's people became a people of God. The Hebrew verb for wrestle is used only one time in the Old Testament. And it's from its uses that there's a word play that helps set the stage for today's story. From the Hebrew word wrestle, which is Yaakabed, we also find the name Jacob. In Hebrew, Yaakov. And Jabok, which is the river that Jacob is next to, which actually means wrestling river, is Yeabok. Now realize that this Genesis text that we're working with today is muddy and mysterious about who it was that wrestled with Jacob. For biblical scholars are all over the place as to who he is in this Jacob story. Some scholars believe that it could be Esau. Others say it was an angel. And still others, it was Jacob's conscience. But a good number believe that Jacob was wrestling with God. I think that the Genesis writers decided to give us a lack of clarity on this particular point so so that we are allowed to take a look at a whole possible bunch of interpretations, meanings, or connections based on where we're at in our own lives. But here's what we know about this story. We understand that this story is centered on the holy, on the divine. The divine who wrestles Jacob. And from this grappling match, we find that Jacob is changed, transformed. So let's go back and take a look at the story again and try to gain a little deeper insight into this purpose of this divine wrestling match. Previously in Genesis, in fact, just two weeks ago, we heard the story of Jacob as a young man who ran away as a fugitive from his homeland. He had stole his twin brother's birthright and blessing, and he left, ran. It's because of those actions that the name of Jacob becomes synonymous with words like cheater, manipulator, liar, conniver. And as Jacob's story progresses, we see that he continually exudes many of those ugly descriptions throughout his lifetime. Then from last week's Genesis lesson, we find that that Jacob left Israel and fled to a place called Haran, which happened to be his mother's homeland. And there he found employment uh, by, uh, by working for Rebekah's brother Laban, who, like Jacob, was a conniving, was cunning and conniving. Well, Uncle Laban manipulated Jacob into working for him for 20 years, working as a farmhand, working so that he could have the right to marry Uncle Laban's daughter, Rachel. But as the story relays, Jacob married Rachel along with Leah, the older sister, and two other servants of Leah and Rachel. So Jacob has an instant family. And as the text plays out, we also understand that Jacob marries into responsibility that family brings about. Well, after 20 years of servanthood, Jacob, who had been working himself into more and more of his father-in-law's share of the wealth, decided to leave Haran and head back to Israel. So in today's episode, Jacob, who 
two decades before had left home as a cheating pauper, is now ready to return home to Israel, reflective, prosperous, responsible. And yet Jacob entered today's story facing a day of reckoning, as returning home meant that he would have to face up with his past. What Jacob had denied and ran from continually followed him throughout those 20 years. And now it was time to face up with it. That's where Jacob is at in today's Genesis narrative. Jacob was going home where he had left a whole number of skeletons. And it was during the night before his reckoning, after he had set all of his family to the opposite side of the ford of the Jacob River, that he now alone faces his past and is looking into his future. And there in the darkness, Jacob racked with fear, he finally took on the uninvited guest, the one who could actually see into his soul. The divine wrestler that wasn't there to offer Jacob some comforting presence, but to open his eyes to his past and help him work into his future. And here's what's so important about this story. Jacob's story about wrestling with the divine, with the holy, with God, is our story. For different times in our lives, we always come to the edge of the wrestling river, and there in our darkness, we're challenged with our past and our future by our faith. But what is it that challenges you and me? When is it that we actually wrestle with God? Well, we wrestle with God when we're facing the unknown and we're afraid. Like Jacob on that riverbank, unsure of what would happen the next morning when he'd have to come face to face with his past, with his brother Esau. We can find ourselves wrestling with God as we are preparing to head into uncharted territory. It might be something like moving from our one place to the next, starting a new career. It might be recognizing a call that God has placed on us that we aren't sure we want to accept. Whenever we find ourselves on the brink of something, especially when it's something that we can't control, when the possible outcome is uncertain and we're afraid, that's a time when we get toe-to-toe -to -toe with God. We also wrestle with God when we're seeking reconciliation with someone we've hurt in the past. Esau had every reason to want to get back at Jacob, and Jacob knew it. Coming home to Esau required great humility on Jacob's part. So if we read further into the Jacob story, into Genesis chapter 33, we find that Jacob climbs down from his animal and he gets down to the ground and he bows to Esau seven times. So wrestling with God prepared Jacob for that kind of humility. And when we want to restore a relationship that has been broken, that humility is something that we find by way of God as well. We wrestle with God when we're about to become something new. Jacob didn't know that he was going to get a new name out of this wrestling match. But that name and that new identity that went with it would not have been possible without a good fight. Jacob's new name, Israel, is translated as one who strives for God. But it can also mean God strives. So this two-way definition reflects the new relationship that God has established with Jacob. When we claim Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are also given a new name, redeemed. It not only reflects our new standing as a beloved child of God, but it also tells the world who it is that's redeemed us. We wrestle with God when it's dark. St. John's of the Cross, a 16th century Spanish monk, wrote about his own struggles, which he described as the dark night of the soul. 
Others have described it as a period of intense suffering when all hope seems to be lost. No one who experiences a dark night of the soul comes out of it unchanged because it's a painful and profound reality that shatters all illusions. For you see, it's in the darkness that our deep questions often get asked, where spiritual struggles become our reality and where growth towards a mature faith begins. But there's another aspect of the dark that we find within this Jacob's story. Remember how the man wrestling with Jacob is concerned about ending their struggle before daybreak? Well, Luther Seminary professor Dr. Terence Fredheim points out that the danger is not that God would be harmed by the daylight, but rather Jacob would. For if Jacob holds on until daybreak, he is a dead man. Throughout the Old Testament, we see this being played out. We see no one can see the face of God and live. In this wrestling match, which is at night, Jacob has been protected from, from seeing God by the darkness. When we grapple with God, it often happens in the darkness of our souls. Not because that's where we often find ourselves in need, but because that's the place where God can meet us without overwhelming us. We wrestle with God when God shows up to confront us. Jacob wasn't expecting anyone except maybe his brother to come at him at the night near the Jabbok River. Yet as soon as all the conditions were right, God showed up as the wrestler, ready to engage Jacob in a sweaty, no-hold-bars battle. When God shows up in our lives, confronting us with our past and preparing us for our future, there's no other option than for us to grab onto God and wrestle. And how do we wrestle? We wrestle with God face to face, close up and personal, because you can't wrestle with God any other way. He's always there. We wrestle with God holding on for dear life because once we've grabbed on to God, we can't let go. We're doomed. You see, wrestling is a full body contact sport. And we understand that Jacob prevailed simply because he wouldn't let go. He held on for dear life. And finally, we wrestle with God holding out for a blessing. Jacob wouldn't release his opponent until he had received a blessing. And the very fact that he asked for a blessing tells us that he understood what was happening, that he was wrestling with the divine. But before he was given that blessing, something else happened to him. Jacob became Israel. Now, the L at the end of Israel is a short form of the name for God. By accepting his new name, Jacob claimed a new identity, an identity that was defined by God's name and identity. Jacob's blessing depended on accepting that fact that he now belonged to God and that God included him in his own name. You can't struggle with God and come out unchanged because any time you come face to face with the living God, you will become something new, transformed, a new creation. So the question isn't really, how do I wrestle with God? Rather, the question becomes, are we ready to be engaged with God? You know, each time that we gather together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we made a decision to come into the Holy presence of the holy where in a sense we stand on the riverbank in the darkness holding on for all that we are to the God who loves us enough to wrestle with us until we claim our new identity as children of God it's then that we will receive the blessings that God is so eager to give us thanks be to God that he stays with us wrestles with us Amen.
living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. We believe in God, whose love we know in the beauty of his world, in daily bread, in the kindness of human hearts, and most clearly in Jesus of Nazareth. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, whose touch of grace makes our eyes to see, our ears to hear, strengthens us to do all things in him, and delivers us from death to life. We believe in the Holy Spirit, in whose power there is peace, and in whose presence there is joy, and in whose promise we dare to be more. Amen. Gathered into one by the Spirit, let us pray for the church, the world, and for all who are in need. Father, we have sought meaning, comfort, and sustenance from all the wrong places. Grant us your Holy Spirit that our hearts may be turned to your word, that we may hunger for you and the goodness you bring. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Good Shepherd, we give you thanks that you have blessed us beyond what we deserve and give to us your church. Guard our life by your Spirit and strengthen our witness before the nations. Bless all pastors and church workers in their service to us in your name and bless those now considering and preparing for church work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Provider, we too quickly focus on what we lack and not upon your unlimited grace. Bless all relief agencies and services of your church on behalf of the hungry, the homeless, the hurting, and those who have lost hope. Bless those visited by disaster and tragedy, especially in the midst of this plague and pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we are daily blessed to know abundance and freedom. Bless those who defend us from our enemies, who serve us in government, and who protect us in our communities, that they may discern the right path and lead us with honor and integrity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Great Physician, we suffer with all manner of ills and afflictions. Hear us and grant to us healing according to your will, strength in time of trial, and peace at the last. We pray especially for the family of Rose Marie Zita, Lonnie Stokes, Pat Crawford's great niece Anna, Betty Loberg, Kathy Ray's godson, and Lois Braden's great grandson Brandon, for Clara Model, Dr. Sarah Lund, Leo Lentz, Bob and Cheryl Cole's granddaughter, for Sally, Wanda Hoyt, Dorothy Morris, Gary Schwanke, Kathy, John Thoyer, Mary Spurley, Christy Storbachen's nephew Joseph, Anna, Emily Smith, Gerald Hausman, Shannon Badger, Jackie Harkin, Ruthie, and Coralie DeWald, and all those we name in our hearts before you. Good Lord, deliver us and teach us to depend upon your grace in all things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we are daily and richly surrounded with your love and care. Grant us eyes to see your mercies new every morning and grateful hearts that what we have received we may share with those in need and generously support the work of your church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, we ask you to grant us all things needful and to keep from us all things harmful to us and to our salvation, for we trust your wisdom and your love. Teach us to pray without fear, your will be done. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we gather at this table, as I always say, this is not my table or yours, but it is Christ. And it's he who calls to you, saying, this bread is my life for you, this cup is my love for you. So whether you be saint or sinner, seeker or skeptic, there's a place for you at Christ's table because he has made it so. As you gather wherever you are to receive of this communion this morning, know that Christ is there with you because that is what he promises to be with you in bread and cup. So the Lord be with you. Holy God, our maker, redeemer, and healer, in the harmonious world of your creation, the plants and animals, the seas and stars were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred the world, you sent your Son to heal our ills and to form us again into one. Amen. The words spoken to us so long ago, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this 
for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant to my blood, shed for you and for all people. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and the sending of the holy and life-giving Spirit, we wait his coming again to renew the face of the earth. Send now your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this meal. Anoint us with your gift of faith, hope, and love, that with thankful hearts we may be witnesses to your Son. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Go with the blessings of God upon you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.